Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us uh, for our webinar on foot emergencies. Uh, do I have an emergency? And addressing urgent foot problems on call. And uh, in the interest of time, we will we'll begin by introducing our uh, esteemed speakers, uh, Dr. Munz and Dr. Stephen. And my name is Brad Yu. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping uh, uh, items. These are our disclosures in terms of financial relationships. The AO North America is an independent nonprofit surgical specialty society dedicated to improving the care of patients with musculoskeletal injuries, particularly foot injuries. Uh, it does not endorse nor promote the use of any product, service, or commercial entity. So to this evening's learning objectives, uh, we want you to identify some unique hind foot fractures that occur on call, resulting in acute soft tissue compromise. We want you to appreciate the signs of acute foot compartment syndrome, and then we would like for you to have some armamentarium for surgical options uh, to treatment of these uh, kind of concerning conditions. So let's begin. Uh, this is uh, case one. She is a 70-year-old grandmother. She's actually the grandmother of one of our scrub techs who has mild dementia and fell about two days ago. And she kind of just walked it off and didn't really think if it was any problem. And then her son came over and, and looked at her foot and said, hmm, you need to go to the emergency room. So here are our x-rays. We see this lateral view of the foot here. And here are our clinical photos. So, so I'll pose this to... Dr. Munz and Dr. Steven, like, what, what the heck is this? Like, what, do we have to deal with this tonight? It's just a, just a fracture of the heel, isn't it? Yeah, I'll Dr. start off. Uh, yeah. you know, in this particular patient, uh, osteoporotic patient with a delayed presentation, uh, diabetic, uh, this is really a concern from the soft tissues, especially that skin over our heel cord and the posterior foot. And uh, with the large fracture blisters and all that, you already have quite a bit of soft tissue compromise. And um, yeah, this is a limb threatening problem um, from a standpoint of if that skin there and that posterior heel dies, there's really pretty poor salvage operations, uh, you know, with the exception of free tissue transfer typically, and that's not good for shoe wear and long-term function. So this is a... Uh, a big problem that I think you should act right away. Yeah, so we've identified I would comment that you know we're programmed to splint people in neutral position or plantigrade position, and this is the one that uh, you want to obviously splint plantar flexed. You want to likely put a bulky dressing on or uh, at least a uh, dorsal splint to keep them plantar flexed uh, while you're waiting. That's not going to reduce the the fracture or the fragment but it's gonna take some of the pressure off that area uh, while you uh, hopefully get to the operating room in an expedited fashion. And to that point, I would also encourage people to, when if, you're, if a splint is applied, that there is really no direct contact of the posterior heel against the bed. So for example, you put horizontally placed pillows like around the calf area and leave the heel suspended so that you don't potentially cause any ongoing soft tissue embarrassment. And to Dr. Munz's point, I mean, this is what happens uh, when we ignore the problem, and it's a horrible problem. The patient has calcaneal osteomyelitis and a, and a soft tissue wound, which is extraordinarily challenging to address. Uh, I'd like to bring your attention to the intrinsic deforming forces on that fragment that causes the persistent displacement, the attachment of the tendo Achilles, the triceps surae on the calcaneal process causes that cranial migration. And that is not going to go away. That will only continue to push up against that soft tissue uh, of the heel and cause uh, further soft tissue problems. And so one of my, uh, one of the most um, notable uh, mentors in my life has always impressed upon me that tongue fractures or these types of calcaneal avulsion fractures do not happen without some underlying Aquinas problems. And as you can see here, the tendo Achilles is pulling against that fragment and that intrinsic force can't be neutralized. It can, you can try to make it better, as Dr. Stevens said, by plantar flexing the foot, but, but this is an issue. All right, so here we go. We're, we, we got, we've identified the problem. We know that the, it's a problem if we don't do something about it more or less right away. So what do we do? Hey, Brad, really quick, uh, just to ask you two guys, um, is this, you know, now we have trauma rooms out there and we can always do it the next morning, maybe at 7.30? But this comes in at 7 p.m. 
uh, is this a middle of the night surgery or, you know, how much, how long do you wait on these patients or do you wait? Do you, do you post this emergent in your hospital? Go ahead, Brad. No, no. Oh, okay. Um, uh, I, I would. Um, and that's not just because we're giving a, uh, um, a webinar on ac acute foot emergencies. This is, this is one of those things that gets me out of bed as along with like compartment syndrome, uh, because time is of the essence and you really need to address the ongoing soft tissue embarrassment. Yeah. I I mean, obviously 7 PM, uh, is in one of those situations where you try and get there as soon as possible to the operating room. So this would be certainly booked for, or posted for us. And then you get into shades. Okay. Is it 12 o'clock? Is it midnight? Is it two o'clock? You know, but I think that certainly this is a time bomb for me and, and, you know, it's as soon as possible to the operating room. And it, again, it depends on where you're working and what you're doing. If you have a trauma room the next day and it's two in the morning or three in the morning, then okay, first case. But if it's a seven o'clock at night, this is one that you want to get there before like 12 hours may make a huge difference for this person. Okay. So what are you going to do, Dave? Uh, well, you know, you're going to post this and go to the operating room and I would try my best to do this closed. Uh, I don't think it needs to be perfect in the outset. What you need to do is get the pressure off the skin for sure. And so for these, I've tried my best to do this percutaneously. So percutaneous clamps, uh, we now have a collinear clamp or you can use pelvic clamps. I find that the large pointed reduction forceps do work, but in an osteoporotic situation, sometimes they just cut through. So sometimes I'll open up the pelvic clamp set that have, or even the periarticular set that kind of ice tongs that provide a little bit more uh, soft tissue friendly because the, the large clamps will tend to really crush the skin quite a bit. And if that's all you can have, then you can use that. But something that you can kind of come around circumferentially and grab that fragment, and you're going to be basing the other side of the clamp on the plantar aspect. So you need to make a small incision. You need C-arm for this. Uh, so you know where the clamps are going. And then you make a decision whether you're going to use some form of uh, screw fixation or you're going to temporize with K-wires. And that depends, I think, on your comfort level, putting the screws in, the degree of uh, whether it involves a bit of the subtalar joint. So you may not want to uh, put something in there permanently like screws. You may want to temporize. And then uh, depending on, again, what the bone quality is like, how big the fragment is, you may uh, just proceed with screw fixation. Annulated screws are nice because you can put the uh, wires in and then come over top. But if you don't have those, certainly uh, you can go ahead and put regular screws in. You have to be careful because usually you're putting them in dorsal to plantar. You have to be careful of the sural nerve laterally. So you have to, you know, make sure either you're using sleeves of some description or, you know, a nice incision where you can get uh, fairly nice soft tissue uh, uh, protection, if you will. So that's kind of the overview and the technique would be obviously plantar flexed. I tend to do these lateral uh, if possible, because then I get better access to the, the circumferentially, uh, not prone per se, but lateral and um, plantar flex the foot. Obviously to release the gastroc pull that you uh, nicely uh, referenced. And then following that, um, probably a negative pressure type dressing uh, for the skin and, and follow up closely. And these are the ones I don't send home, obviously admit them for observation. And then the, I guess the next question with your point is whether you do, uh, an immediate, uh, gas rust recession. I haven't done that in the vast majority, although I might consider that down the road just because the soft tissues for me are a little bit precarious. So I might consider that down the road. Okay. Um, so that's pretty much exactly what we did. Uh, and so we, brought the patient to, from the, in the emergency room, the patient's plantar flexed, heels off the bed, bring the patient expedite, 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 <laughs> expedited manner to the operating room. And we uh, attempt a closed reduction utilizing uh, these point to point tenaculums. Um, uh, so the, the, the tines have to go through the heel skin, which always gives me a little bit of uh, consternation. Um, and in this particular instance, uh, I used the, I used two clamps, but one of the clamps is actually docked outside the skin around the prior clamp, which is touching the skin, touching the bone. And that way we don't necessarily have to give it a double whammy in terms of, uh, 
in terms of soft tissue injury. And then of course we try to do this as expeditiously pos as possible because that, that heel, we really try to avoid as much uh, pressure on the sole of the foot as well. And that's then what I really, go, go back. Can you go back? Brad? So that's what I'm alluding to. And it's kind of, you know, that feeling that you're just doing more soft tissue, but they're not soft tissue damage. They're not on there that long, but sometimes the, the uh, pelvic clamps that have the little spheres on them with the spike sometimes docks a little bit better and you can get a little bit of that tension off the skin at least. Yeah. Just another comment. Um, I agree with Dave's points. Um, I tend to do these either lateral or prone. I think it's very uh, challenging to have a bump large enough with the trajectory to do these supine. And I think that's where folks can get into trouble. I think you have to be very precise with your clamp placement, anticipating where you're going to put your screws. Uh, one point of using clamps that have a larger aperture is you don't crush that planter skin quite as much, but they're only going to be on there for a small amount of time. So it's not as big of a deal, but you can also consider that. And then I would really consider with your plan where you're going to place your screws uh, these small osteoporotic fragments in this particular patient, if you drill a hole and your trajectory of your screw is not where you want that, you take it out then you drill another hole, you can take a pretty thin little fracture wedge and turn it into two different fractures or split that piece longitudinally. So be careful with the size of your screws and the trajectory. And uh, I do like the idea of using washers for these very small uh, cranial avulsions. I've even placed a plate, a little third tubular plate to broaden that surface area for the screws just there dorsally. Um, and then from a rehabilitation standpoint for these, I rehab these just like an Achilles disruption and plantar flexion and slowly bring them up with time. And then I think the gastroc recession is for sure a good idea just to offload some of the deforming force. So Dr. Bones, you're saying that if you split this shell of a fragment, if, so I got lucky, right? And so if I split that like right down the center, what, what would you do at that point? Yeah, great. You know, great point. Uh, that's where I have bailed out to a plate. I think if you truly make a very small wedge, that's when I'm going to soft tissue repair and doing more like a pure Achilles avulsion type in, uh, injury uh, with uh, suture anchors. I've even tied buttons on the plantar aspect of the foot for revision cases. But I think the primary prevention of that's probably the best in that, you know, it seems like, especially for these, we want to overpower our screws and go with larger screws. And I would just caution you, these look like either 3.5 or, you know, 4.0 cortical screws. I wouldn't go large. You know, you don't need 7.3 screws for this. You can be very precise a lag by technique or have a clamp assisted reduction and then place your screws. So you can see here, this is the kind of biologic footprint that ultimately we render for the patient. There's small incisions. We can actually see that hemorrhagic blister is like a poached egg. It's still uh, intact and uh, just kind of attests to the kind of hands-off uh, manner in which this fracture was reduced. This patient went on to do relatively well. Uh, she, uh, uh, healed her fracture relatively uneventfully. You can see up here the evidence of uh, the, the strayer that we performed. Uh, I did that acutely. Her soft tissues proximally were not terrible, so I, I didn't feel terribly concerned about uh, doing an acute strayer. And then this is this is the lady kind of on her way out the door uh, into uh, the rest of her her, her, her um, the rest of her day uh, relatively well. Here's some other examples, just really briefly. Sometimes the fragment is not an extra articular fragment, and it's actually part of the articular surface in a in a in a tongue morphology type fracture. Um, and so, in this particular instance, since a definitive reconstruction would be uh, entertained, uh, this can be done percutaneously. So, for all of the folks that are on this call that will potentially just need to get through the evening, uh, this is another option of percutaneously wiring the fracture. Um, and then uh, allowing your foot and ankle trained trauma surgeon to uh, to come back and, and rest restore the anatomy. And then this was just another example 
of another way of approaching the fracture fragment, which is basically you executing the descending limb of the uh, uh, lateral extensile approach in order to gain access to the tuberosity fragment. Particularly, maybe in, in, in Dr. Munz's case, if you need to plate this, for example, would you would you use an incision kind of like this, or would you look make it more kind of more horizontal? Yeah, I mean, if you want to plate directly on the top of the tuber, I just do a trans Achilles approach, just a longitudinal incision there, and plate right in that uh, retro Achilles surface. Uh, but for reduction, I think if you need to perform an open reduction, I do like this vertical limb of the extensile approach uh, to clean and to clamp. Okay. All right. I can All I right. ask a question about how your how you your post operative protocol for that patient that you treated that you demonstrated? Yep. You, so so I. <clears throat> yep. It, just like Dr. Bunce, I I, I placed the patient with Achilles wedges. And then serially uh, removed them, extracted them over time, and then once the uh, once she was plantar grade, that is no wedges in a cam walking boot, then I would let her. I let her. I advanced her uh, weight bearing. So about six weeks, six to eight weeks before I let her uh, fully weight bear. Yeah. All right, um, <clears throat> we're moving on now. This is uh, this is our second case here. Um, I'll, I'll I'll leave it to Dr. Stephen. So this is uh... a. 33 year old male who was struck by a car actually run over and he presents with uh, some other injuries, but we'll concentrate on his left foot. He's got a left foot deformity, more or less a quino cable varus uh, deformity. So it doesn't look right. He's, it's a closed injury. His skin is actually not too bad. There's uh, some early bruising, uh, but the, positive findings or the significant findings is he's got uh, absent plantar sensation, his dorsal sensation, lateral incision, uh, sorry, lateral sensation is intact um, for the most part. And he's got weak uh, uh, Doppler roll dorsalis pedis, but an absent uh, tibial uh, Doppler. And so he is, uh, his vital signs are stable at this point. And because he is in the trauma bay, this is the x-ray that was obtained. It's a lateral, you can see a portable. And uh, this is the initial x-ray. John? Yeah, I'll take this one. Uh, something's not right. That's I could just tell you straight <laughs> off. Uh, this is a, a broken or dislocated bone must fix. Um, you have dislocations of your subtalar, tibial tailor, and your talonavicular space. Uh, it's hard to tell direction, but I think from some of your clinical history, you can elucidate that. Um, but for sure, this is a dislocation that uh, uh, I would like to have another view if possible. But in a trauma situation, sometimes that's not possible, especially if they have other systemic injuries. But uh, I'm suspecting some form of subtalar dislocation pattern. Okay, running the tape here. So we'll start off with the axials. We've got bilateral uh, images. You can modulate the speed of that because it's going pretty quick. Um, yeah, so you can just grab that bar and just slow it down, I think. Uh, yeah. Oh, I see, I see. Yeah, so you can grab that and just slow it down. So you can see he's got some marginal uh, fractures of uh, the tarsal bones, uh, some avulsions off the talus itself likely lateral, some lateral process, possibly posterior process. He's got a fracture of the margin of the divicular as well. Taylor head fracture, but I'm not sure about that. It may be very uh, peripheral, uh, but you can see uh, complete dislocation, almost a, a uh, incarcerated Taylor head on his navicular medially, and uh, probably a little bit of subluxation of his calcaneum cubo joint, probably not, but uh, might be. And so, uh, as John suspected, this is the less common uh, variant of a subtalar dislocation. It is uh, lateral, meaning that the talus, talar head body has gone medial, and the remaining foot and hind foot has gone lateral. So this is usually associated with higher higher energy trauma uh, than the more common uh, variant, which is the la the medial, meaning that the uh, foot has gone um, medial. And so uh, in this situation, uh, you can see that uh, the Taylor head is dislocated out beside the navicular. 
There's also subluxation of the tibio tailor or ankle joint in, some, in the coronal view here. <clears throat> and then and just go forward. So just a reconstituted 3D and just uh, kind of drives home the 2D reconstructions and the axial views. You can see you got a bit of a CTA there. So he did have a CTA for this. You can see one of the reasons he's got a Doppler roll dorsalis pedis, it's intact. You can't really make much out, at least I couldn't. And I, you know, getting this case together, I kind of scrutinized the soft tissue windows and I, I thought I could follow the, the plantar arteries, uh, but they, they uh, you can see that they may reconstitute distally in the foot. So any concerns with the CTA or the findings now, uh, John, and this patient comes in at eight o'clock in the evening or Brad even uh, comes in at eight o'clock in the evening. Is this person going to be posted at seven in the morning or? Yeah. I mean, I think with, um, you know, with your clinical history of the, the pulse um, abnormality, as well as that um, insensate plantar foot, you know, the neurovascular structures on the medial foot there are compromised by that dislocated Taylor head. And this is one where uh, I would attempt something in the emergency department, but if it was unsuccessful, uh, I would be taking this uh, emergently to reduce uh, just because of your other compromise. You said the soft tissues are fine, but yep. where that Taylor head is extruded uh, is causing uh, issues with the neurovascular bundle there on the medial side. Do you have any concerns with the skin? So they're fine, you know, uh, within an hour of the injury. Do you have any concerns on the skin, much like the, the last case, just related to the Taylor head? Or <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, I mean, these can for sure have um, issues with the medial skin. But in this particular patient, my my push would be the neurovascular bundle. But for sure, the skin's on the table because that skin also you want to protect. Uh, what would be your close reduction maneuver here? Yeah, I mean, I think the the hardest thing is with this amount of instability and the you know dislocation to multiple joints. I think getting the length and trying to clear that navicular around the Taylor head, uh, I think is going to be uh, problematic. Uh, also, too, I do think that although the fractures on the lateral side are from whenever the, everything dislocated, you could also have obstructing lesions there also. But I would try to uh, hyperflex the knee uh, to relax the heel cord and try to get some longitudinal traction as well as some foot traction and attempt it. But in this, I have concern that you're going to be going to the OR, so I wouldn't try too hard. Yeah, I mean, this is a analogous perhaps to the posterior dislocation that's irreducible with the posterior wall and the acetabulum. You know, are you going to do more damage if you try a closed reduction? Uh, I think that it's important to get, for me, it's important to get a CT so I can know if there, because I've had, I can think of at least one case where there's been a partial Taylor head and we've tried a close reduction and we've completely knocked it off. So, yeah. you know, for me, it's, it's a judgment call. I think that the Taylor head here is mostly intact. It's probably a function also how quickly you get there, how much sedation you, or relaxation, if you want to call it that in the emergency department, you're, you're able to get. And so, you know, this would be a low threshold for me to go to the war, um, in this kind of situation where it's probably incarcerated, I don't know if incarcerated is the right word, but at least uh, not going to be easy to reduce. And that's one of the reasons I asked about the closed reduction maneuver, because I'm not sure, because I think you've got competing uh, issues. you got a subtalar dislocation and a tailored navicular dislocation. And so one maneuver may, may supersede the other, or at least get in the way. So. Yeah, I mean, I think this here, to your point, you know, that, that dislocated CT scan, we don't like seeing dislocated CT scans of any joint, really, but this does give you information. Uh, I've had similar patients, and you have a non-displaced neck fracture here in these real high energy, and you convert that neck to a displaced neck in this pattern. That's very problematic. So, you know, I'd, I hate to see the dislocated views, but you can still get information about obstructing lesions in the next plan. Okay. So he's brought to the operating room on an urgent basis. And, and this uh, just is a small uh, component of what we were 
uh, hoping to have ready for the operating room. So some form of external fixation. We had a distractor as well on standby just because uh, we have it. And I think it's a nice way of providing distraction. Uh, that schematic on the right is just to show the kind of a rough guide of what a distractor looks like. And obviously in this situation, you're going to put it uh, in the calcaneus likely from the medial side and in the tib tibia. So this is not going into the tailor neck as you might do for a pilon, for example. And that uh, picture beside it is the Hinterman distractor, which was popularized for total ankle replacements by Hinterman. And we've kind of stole it from the from that perspective and used it in trauma in a lot of applications because it functions the same as a distractor, but you can apply it locally between the bones and it's not as heavy. and um, it's much like a lamina spreader, except that it's uh, two pin based. And so it's usually a 2.5 pin that goes in the larger hole and you can put a derotation pin in there if you like. It comes, uh, you know, either apart or together. And then obviously we're going to most likely temporize with K-wires. I don't think there's anything to put in with screws here. Uh, and most likely if we have to do an open reduction, which is our plan B, is we're going to need... Uh, negative pressure dressing and obviously a CR. Dave, can you go to like, talk a little bit more about this? You mentioned this negative pressure wound dressing already. Um, what do you do? Do you just wrap the whole foot with the sponge? Yeah, I, don't, and I don't have any shares in the company, but uh, I think that for these issues that are evolving with the soft tissues, and ag again, it's a, it's a judgment call, but I, I don't necessarily just put, you know, like the one of the classic things is just put the foam or the, I should say the sponge just along the incision. I tend to give a more generous wrap around with the sponge because I think the zone of injury is larger. And then depending on the situation, I may put the entire uh, offsite around it. And I know there are available uh, sponges you can incorporate the entire foot uh, to the uh, injury as well. And then how long do you keep the negative pressure wound dressing on in place? Yeah, so that's, that's always the dilemma, right? Cause you, you know, you want to check the wound probably four to five days, some in, okay. in the neighborhood. Okay. So this is just a small sample of the various images we took, uh, trying to do a close reduction. And, and again, I think that, um, it just speaks to, and this was obviously complete, complete paralysis and flexing the knee, flexing, uh, sorry, flexing the knee and extending and flexing the, the foot and ankle. Uh, that's just a localizer, that image with the elevator on it. We didn't make a small, I didn't really want to make a small incision and trying to, you know, do the sterile shoehorn technique uh, just because I thought I might do more damage. What I did do is localize the tailor neck uh, and put a, half pin in just to try and manipulate it despite uh i'm not sure i saw that undisplaced neck john but uh anyway uh we tried that that didn't work and uh on top of that we did try the distractor to try and increase the space available uh for uh the talus that just shows the just localizing for the calcaneal pin Yep. Just one comment. Uh, I really like that uh, image with uh, the freer elevator or some sort of instrument just to localize because in the dislocated anatomy, uh, some of your landmarks are off for palpation to make more formal incisions. And I think you're going to have your, uh, your fluoroscopy there anyway, just to be precise and to mark that and understand the soft tissue displacement. Because whenever you're making your incision and maybe a more formal and a remedial approach or whatever approach you choose, the, uh, the anatomy's changed because of the dislocation and you can have issues with uh, structures not being in the correct spot that you normally anticipate them in. So just to you know, use that as a guide. I think that's an excellent point. Uh, the If you one was to entertain a surgical approach in the classic manner of like an anteromedial approach, one would potentially put that incision where the where, where it would be if the talus was reduced. And if you, if one can, if you wanted small percutaneous incisions, you can make them in line with that incision so that you're not making these kind of awkwardly placed small stab incisions that might compromise the skin bridges when you do your definitive approach. Yeah, true. So here we are. This is, I can't tell you how many uh, iterations we try to close reduction, but it, 
certainly we didn't persist much more than probably 20 minutes, 20 to 30 minutes, maybe. I, I'm trying to remember, but it wasn't that long. <laughs> <laughs> so what do we what do we do now? Um so at this point, I there likely is not only insufficient space being created for the talus to nestle into, I would be uh, suspicious that there would be into susception of uh, fracture fragments, maybe capsular tissue or an imbricated tendon that's kind of kind of doing something it shouldn't, and, and I these need to be mechanically disengaged and um, and because of the nature of all the nerves and and other arterial systems involved. Uh, I think that should be done open. Right. And what you said, a uh, tendon, which tendon usually? Uh, well, it depends upon the dislocation. So uh, in a lateral dislocation, you you think of uh, the medial, that the head is more medial than it should be. So likely it's going to be wrapped up by medially based structures, such as the posterior tibial tendon, tibial nerve, the flexor digitorum longus, flexor hallucis longus, uh, and, and the like. Tom, Dick, and Harry. Yeah. Okay, um, so this is uh, just a nice diagram or picture of uh, just a medial approach that you would use for a Taylor neck. This is from Sean Norkin, I think Dave Bray, at any rate, uh, just along the course of the uh, medial malleolus between tibialis anterior anteriorly and tib post in line with the first metatarsal and you extend down. And we started kind of a small incision and it got bigger and bigger and just to allow us visualization. And this is just showing what you see in this situation here. This is a Taylor neck. We reinserted that uh, chance pin into the Taylor neck for uh, manipulation. Certainly you could argue you could have used it. I could have used a two millimeter K-wire, but we had the hole there. So we reutilized that. And uh, you see that anterior retractor, uh, we were able to see over because the talus was dislocated immediately. We were able to see over into the space. There was a small, a couple of small fragments that if you remember on the 3d were present, uh, we took those out. We irrigated the area of the subtalar joint and the tailor navicular joint, just to ensure there wasn't any hematoma or soft tissues. And, uh, not to belabor it, but we did find uh, some soft tissue that was kind of, uh, tendinous, if you will. And I could see the tip post as it came down. So it wasn't the tip post and we kind of freed that off a little bit, but it was uh, ultimately the flexor digitorum longus. And I was about to release some soft tissue and it turned out it was the uh, neurovascular bundle that had wrapped around with the FDL around the Taylor head. So it was a good thing we didn't uh, kind of incise that or excise that and kind of took an elevator and just flipped it around the Taylor head and everything kind of popped back into place. So the, the, I'm just showing that, that I had that in the, I had marked that out just in case, uh, for whatever reason, it wasn't reducible from the medial side. I was prepared to go lateral as you would for a tailor neck, just to uh, make sure there wasn't any uh, small fragments or larger enfolded soft tissue, such as perhaps ed, ed, extensor digitorum brevis on that lateral side, or even perineal tendons that had been entrapped just because of the degree of dislocation, which it, we didn't need to do in this situation. So that's just the operative node. It was a buttonhole flexor digitorum longus. The, as Brad said, the, the vast majority of these that are irreducible would be tib, tibialis posterior or posterior tibial tendon that's uh, wrapped around the tailor head and incarcerated. And so once reduced, uh, we just went ahead and pinned. So this is from the, the longitudinal pins from the down from the kineiform from the medial side into the talus and then a planter pin. And because the ankle was unstable, we crossed that uh, into the tibio tailor joint. Just there. And you could argue that's not really great. Maybe an X fix to add an X fix. And I, I don't think that's wrong. I thought about it, but it was pretty stable. So you would uh, keep the X fix you had on from the tibia to the calcaneus and likely add a midfoot pin down in the kineiforms just to have a, a triangular stability with the X fix for all the three joints. And so if there was any concern about the soft tissues, one, or I wasn't happy with the guide, the K wires, then I certainly would have left the X fix on, which we didn't. So this is him at a year. 
his plantar sensation did come back, but it's certainly not normal. And uh, he's doing okay. Uh, I did have plans to come back and fix his lateral ligaments. And you can see there's a little fragment there, uh, but he got a little bit uh, unwell, shall we say, and I never had the opportunity to come back. Just a quick literature review that this was first described, uh, you know, a good time ago. The vast majority are medial dislocations, and most of those can be reduced closed, as uh, John alluded to. The lateral ones are higher energy. There's less of a chance of successful closed reduction. And usually the etiology of failed closed reduction is a posterior tibial tendon or something off the talus, whether it's a head fragment, so incarcerated in the navicular or a lateral process. And that's just the schematic from, from one of the papers. Yeah, just a couple comments about these long term. You know, most common are, are medial dislocations, and you can just imagine how your foot would supinate and not having the, the fibula there on the medial side. Uh, it's easier for the foot to go uh, medial and the talus to go lateral. Well, in these lateral dislocations, it's, op it's opposite. Uh, the foot's going lateral and the talus is going medial. And you can imagine the, the, the energy there getting around that fibula and just how much soft tissue injury there is. And long term, from a standpoint of counseling patients, these um, lateral dislocations have much higher uh, post-traumatic arthritis and other soft tissue issues long term uh, just because of the mechanism and the violence. Uh, I've had patients with these lateral dislocations where they've avulsed the FDL muscle belly from the calf. And <laughs> literally you just bring the whole tendon out with no muscle attached to it. <laughs> and you can imagine just the soft tissue trauma and how violent the foot has to be turned laterally for that to happen. And yeah. especially, you know, how dense the retinacular structures are on the medial foot for that tailor head to buttonhole through the medial structures, obviously is much more high energy. Uh, just a quick picture here of another uh, telltale sign of an extruded body and something that might be a little concerning is you can see here that that flexed IP joint of the uh, of the hallux. Uh, so that's because the posterior body has been pushed posteriorly and it's causing impingement on the flexor hallucis longus. In this particular patient, uh, they had tibial nerve embarrassment as well. And, and that's the reason why uh, we brought this patient to the operating room urgently for a reduction of the body. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Stephen. Uh, okay. Let's move on to the, the uh, third case here, which is uh, uh, Dr. Munz will talk to us. Yeah. This last one is a 16 year old male, high speed uh, car crash. A patient was ejected and he had uh, left foot and ankle deformities and uh, some diminished pulses. So uh, any of the other panelists want to comment on anything they see here? Um. Sure. Certainly, I see a uh, complete tibial tailor dislocation posteriorly with the concomitant uh, injury to the tarsum and the tarsal articulations. Most readily apparent on the lateral radiograph, you can see that the dorsal portion of the cuneiforms is not collinear with that of the uh, uh, metatarsals, which is uh, one of the telltale signs for tarsal metatarsal instability. On this AP with this plantar flexed foot on the left panel, uh, the second ray and the first ray look like they are uh, in different zip codes. So this is very concerning that uh, maybe an arterial system potentially could have been damaged, namely the dorsalis pedis, as uh, it dives into that inner space. Perfect. Yeah, this is say, yeah, cuneiform there. Sorry, go ahead, Brett. Sorry to interrupt. So this is uh, just more of your foot films. I think you see the midfoot instability as well as the exit there out the metatarsal head necks, uh, just with the amount of violence this foot and ankle um, sustained. Uh, next. So this was a closed reduction and uh, of the ankle and uh, attempted closed reduction of the midfoot. And if you can go to the next slide. Uh, this is a clinical photograph and we were planning to go to the operating room for the ankle instability and the persistent dislocation of the midfoot and this uh, soft tissues. So if you can go to the next slide. Can I ask John, so th this is something that, you know, we see all the time and 
let's ignore the ankle just for a second. And so the midfoot displacement, is this something that you think is an emergency or can it wait to be referred? Uh, can it wait two or three days when someone that knows what they're doing with the midfoot deal with? Yeah. So some issues here with the soft tissues and so forth, but. Yeah. I mean, I think if the, the soft tissues are completely fine, uh, I don't like the idea of that uh, complete uh, tarsal metatarsal you know, dislocation there uh, that, that medial cuneiform can also cause medial skin issues. So I don't think necessarily the bony injury uh, with very good soft tissues is exactly an emergency. Uh, I'd like to get that taken care of sooner than later, but I don't think that's a middle of the night thing. Uh, I don't think these should be sent out and seen in two weeks type deal. Uh, I'm an end user of taking care of a lot of these and uh, getting gross realignment early on. I think is important. So uh, I mean, this is this isn't something with just the bony injury that you probably have to do in the middle of the night. But when you start getting soft tissues like this, I think it does change that. Brad, can you go back to the lateral? So I, I think the you know the lateral displacement of that first metatarsal and cuneiform is important, but the injury lateral. The other thing you can see sometimes you see the dorsal displacement. That's usually the second metatarsal. I've seen more than a couple of cases. They, you know, they're very sick. They go off to ICU and you don't get to the operating room and that skin will turn uh, necrotic from the pressure. And sometimes it's pretty unstable. Sometimes you can reduce it just with closed means, but it tends to pop back down. So, or pack, excuse me, pop back up and cause uh, skin pressure. And so that creates a whole, you know, other kettle of fish and problems, but uh, sometimes if you're in the operating room, say for whatever it is, an associated ankle fracture, like this case, you can just put pressure down on that second metatarsal and, and just simply put a K wire, not simply, but put a K wire in just to hold it down. And that takes the pressure off the skin, uh, for sure as a temporizing maneuver. This is yeah. obviously quite a bit more complicated than that, but, but, but I mean, to, to your point, Dave, like I've seen patients have actually necrosis of the medial skin where that prominent medial cuneiform is. Yes. And if you look at this AP radiograph or the pseudo AP on the left, you can see that the second metatarsal is, is articulating with the next cuneiform over. So there's, right. there's like a heck of a lot of displacement going on and, and, uh, and it just drapes that medial skin over that, that corner of the cuneiform and it causes uh, soft tissue problems. The other thing that's impressed is if you get uh, sedation very early on when these people come in, it's amazing how accurate you can get a reduction early on. Uh, but if this sits for even more than a couple of hours, it's really difficult. So if you can get something uh, something reduced very early in this situation, then it it really helps, I think. Yeah. May I ask the panelists, do you, do, do you ever encounter an irreducible dislocation in this nature, just like our last case? And, and what do you do about it? Yeah. I mean, I think this one here, um, our residents, I'm at a training center. So our residents are very happy getting the ankle reduced. And I think the energy to get the foot reduced uh, was waning. So this one, they didn't get it reduced. Um, I think to all the points that were said, whenever you have these uh, regardless of the dislocation pattern, prioritizing that dorsal and medial skin, because these are always failing in abduction or the midfoot's abducting. So that medial and dorsal skin are the, are the, are the issues. And I think if you have um, typically with just sedation and traction in the operating room, you can get things grossly realigned and pin. I really like the point made about the Kirchner wires. Uh, I tend to pin these and cut the wires beneath the skin especially for midfoot injuries that are going to be a few weeks to not have pin, you know, pin issues. But I really like the idea of uh, that close reduction. Doesn't have to be perfect, but get the pressure off the skin and use percutaneous wires to hold. I, I have yet to hear the word external fixator. What are your yeah, thoughts? I, I don't use that very often. I'll save that for bad soft tissues, say an open injury or something that just, for whatever reason, I just can't hold with a K-wire. Uh, you can use the small external fixation system. So the four millimeter pins, you can put a pin from the tailor neck 
medially down to the first metatarsal and then laterally the fifth metatarsal and the calcaneus. And you can basically like you would for a pilon, you can kind of apply longitudinal traction to uh, each side. You can even connect them across the foot if you like. And you can combine that with um, pins as well. So if it's a real unstable situation, maybe fracture dislocation that maybe the pins aren't going to hold as well. That's a rare time that I would think and consider a, a spanning external fixation, but I have used that. A question for the two of you, uh, whenever you pin these, what, what size pins do you use and where do you tend to put them and how many? Hmm. Good. Go ahead, Brent. Gonna go, y'all go ahead, Dave. No, go ahead, Brent. Okay. Uh, well, I wouldn't use something small. I wouldn't use like a one two point a one point two five millimeter wire. I would be worried that it would uh, just with like physiologic movement or pathologic physiologic movement that uh, those wires will break inside uh, the joint and that'd be extraordinarily hard to extract. So usually like two point oh millimeter wires is what I do. Um, certainly, if you inserted more than one pin it would control uh, ro axial rotation. However, that's not really the goal. The goal is essentially just to keep things in the right neighborhood. And naturally, every time you place a pin, you're, you're destroying a little bit of bone, which might make your definitive fixation just a little bit more challenging. So uh, I guess uh, to my point, just maybe one or two pins at the most uh, across any dislocated tarsal metatarsal joint. For me, the, the go-to is the first and second tarsal metatarsal joint. In this case, you've got some Taylor, uh, sorry, metatarsal neck fractures. So boy, it'd be nice to, again, seeing these patients late, particularly the plantar flexed uh, metatarsal heads are really annoying to people. So if sometimes you can come underneath the toes, the lesser toes, and start your pin right on the metatarsal head, just a little bit beside the plantar aspect of the proximal phalanx. So you're lifting the toe up or extending the toe and starting the, the pin because the metatarsals are 20 degrees plantar flexed, you kind of go from plantar to dorsal direction from the plantar surface. And it'd be nice to, to get those lined up. And in that situation, you can just run those K wires right into the um, metatarsal tarsal joint if, if you're so inclined. But if I didn't have that, then likely a medial pin from the first metatarsal into the keniform, you can take that right into the navicular, if not the talus, and then something for the second metatarsal. And generally uh, the third will follow the second, but not always. And then if you have a four or five instability, much like you would definitive fixation, you can put a pin off the lateral side of the foot for four or five, but obviously you need C arm as well. So two, probably at a minimum, but possibly three, if not four, if the lateral column, in other words, the fourth, fifth tarsal metatarsal joints disrupt. Yeah, I really like all that. You know, I, I think the point about how the first uh, tarsal metatarsal joint is going to travel by itself and then two, three, four, five, because of intermetatarsal ligaments are gonna to travel together. So you can almost consider both of those. You gotta control one and then two, three, four, five, however you can. And I tend to use, you know, one, six for more yeah. laterally based pins and two, oh, for more medially based pins. But I for sure wouldn't use any smaller than one, six, uh, just from that issue of breakage or bindage. If you can go yeah, to the I next kind of slide. Back and forth between one, six, two, oh. I, I would also uh, encourage irrigation. So, you know, especially in a younger person, they're going to have real hard bone. So you're going to start cooking the bone a little bit if if you don't irrigate. So I, I'm a real irrigator of K-wires for sure. How do you, you do can, that? How do you do that? Do you, you just put the water, the, as you percutaneously place the pin in, you put the uh, water on top of the pin? Yeah. And the other thing I do is sometimes I'll get a wet sponge, but that that's kind of not as not as good. So I just irrigate the heck out of the pin. Hmm. Yes, yeah, so I wanted to show this particular oh, case. Cool. Sorry, John. No, I wanted to show this particular case to get everyone's thoughts on, you know, foot soft tissue issues. Uh, this this patient literally, by the time we got into the operating room and while we were starting to prep, there were multiple areas of blisters forming and the skin blanching. And uh, after reducing the ankle, the pulses were okay. The toes were perfused, but there was this just evolving, pretty significant soft tissue compromise with mottled areas of skin and blanching. So, you know, foot fasciotomies, is that a thing? Or is that just, you know, you let the intrinsic muscles necrose and it's not that big of a deal? What are some thoughts on foot fasciotomies? 
Um, I, I don't think that we should be as nihilistic as potentially we've been told in the past about like, well, you know, they'll just get claw toes because camera toe deformity, claw toe deformity, if you could avoid them, uh, that would be optimal for the patient. Um, it's always the clinical quandary for me, uh, kind of figuring out like, does this patient clinically exhibit signs and symptoms consistent with compartment syndrome? Because gosh, these foot injuries, they're like the most horrible, like painful injuries ever. And so it's very hard for you to clinically identify um, what's going on. I guess I, I'm going to ask, I'm going to turn around that question back to you, John. I mean, how do you determine difference between like compartment syndrome pain versus like just regular smashed foot pain? Yeah. If we can go to the next slide, I just want to show this case and I'll answer that. So, you know, I think there's a lot of controversy. I think uh, in regards to examinations, we're very infrequently tested on the number of co compartments of the foot because there's a lot of controversy if there's three or four or seven or nine or 13. I think that diagnosis is also very challenging. You know, to, to me, the benefits are uh, that long-term neuropathic pain and to protect those soft tissues. If you start losing large areas of skin on the dorsum or plantum of your plantar aspect of your foot, there's not many salvage operations other than soft tissue reconstruction. And then I think we still don't know a long-term about the sequelae of this. Um, I do think that the uh, neuropathic pain issue is a real big one. Whenever you have such long compression that these nociceptive fibers in your foot sometimes are problematic long-term. Next slide. John, can I make a comment? So I yeah, please. think that uh, for me, the, I, I don't know if you're, you're you, I know you're going to get into the kind of nitty gritty about treatment. So maybe I'll just, I, I think that certainly the, concepts and treatment of compartment syndrome of the foot has changed a little bit as far as definitive management. So uh, for me, I've changed over the years about what I do and thank goodness it's pretty uncommon. So, yeah. Yeah. So I think in that initial evaluation to Brad's point, you know, these patients, all of these crushed foot injuries are painful, but I think these patients that really have that intractable pain, you just really can't control it. That's one thing to be alerted to. But also, too, it, it, it's always a little bit different because they have this pain, but then you do an exam and, and they have dense numbness. And it's kind of this counterintuitive. How are they so numb and having this much pain? So I think both of those two things need to alert you. Also, too, when that skin is mottled, blanched, you have these evolving fracture blisters. This is just another foot that might be a little bit different than the typical you know, foot injury. Uh, toes for perfusion, you can have such uh, soft tissue swelling of just the skin that you can have toes that are uh, not perfused as well. And then obviously always consider the mechanism. Next slide. So this was just in the operating room, a reduction technique. If you keep going there, Brad, uh, just showing the pinning uh, here because of the neck fractures. These are 2-0 wires for the first TMT in a cross pin fashion. And it's not perfect on the lateral. You see, you see uh, it's almost plantarly displaced there, but the pressure's off the skin. And you see there, we went ahead and um, fixed the necks on uh, two, three, four, and five, but advanced those wires to Dave's point across the TMT joints for stability. If you go to the next slide, the ankle was X fixed just because of the uh, persistent instability there. Keep going. And then one more slide. This is just another technique of what you can do. It's a pie crusting technique. This is in the literature, but this is really evaluating or kind of considering the compartments as one compartment maybe, and just the skin being a compartment. And this patient was a lot of hematoma. And if you go to the next slide, the technique here is uh, multiple small incisions, usually three to five millimeters, typically done with an 11 or 15 blade of just the skin. You know, you, you really want to consider your future incisions for fixation. You want to leave a space there of uh, a centimeter and a half to two centimeter between rows. And you don't want to strip. This is just incise the skin. And then I tend to use a, um, a hemostat just to evacuate that hematoma. You can squeeze the foot from dorsal to plantar. And just a lot of times getting that burden of hematoma off, uh, you know, can relieve a lot of the pressure on the skin and, uh, you know, uh, especially some of that foot swelling. If you can go to the next slide. Uh, a couple other things. You have to, you know, have bony stability. And we've talked about provisional pinning versus X fix. You're not going to leave the foot dislocated when you're doing this. You want to provide uh, soft tissue stabilization by, you know, providing bony stabilization. 
And then you have to also assess other areas of the foot. And I think occasionally, although rare, uh, you might have to do more formal techniques. If you can go to the next slide. Just to show you this patient, this is three days post-op. I think a negative pressure. I think using Steri-Strips, any type of uh, provisional closure is nice to get some of that edema down. You keep going. This is three weeks later, and these areas have epithelialized. And an important part is, is that you made these in line with future incisions. So for this patient, it was going to be a, you know, one, two inner space and a in line with the fourth ray. But you need to consider that when you're doing this for any subsequent reconstruction. Next slide. And then we don't have to talk about fixation. We're getting light here on time, but come back, provide the definitive fixation when the soft tissues allow. Next slide. And then this is three months post-op, and then at one year, uh, the soft tissues have healed, and you have uh, you know, healed radiographs and a, a foot that has no pain. Next slide. Just to talk about the compartments, this is from the AO archives. You can go to uh, the AO uh, site and uh, reference these, but this is the controversy about compartments and kind of what you need to release. Next slide. Uh, if you're going to do more formal fasciotomies, you have that one, two inner space and in line with four, and then this incision along the medial foot that you're going to access the remaining four to five compartments. So the dorsal incision are for the inner osseous and that hematoma, and then the next slide, your medial incision are going to access these others. So, you know, I still think this is, um, you know, a controversial point, but I'd really have you critically evaluate the skin. I think uh, preserving those soft tissues is paramount. A lot of different techniques. I just wanted to present this high crusting technique tonight. Really, you have to plan for that next step in reconstruction. So I wouldn't go with just huge incisions and bad planes. You got to really plan for that next uh, point of your uh, uh, fixation pathway. And to me, long term, the neuropathic pain is key. You know, you have these patients where you just ignore them, and in a year they still have a almost complex regional pain syndrome foot, despite the bones being healed and everything else. So I would just challenge you to look out for that because I think long term that can really drive a lot of our long term outcomes. Yeah. Happy for comments. Yeah. For, so for me, uh, you know, in the past historically, we did the classic two dorsal incisions and ran in a lot of problems because it's virtually skin, tendon, and bone there, plus uh, obviously the dorsalis pedis and some superficial nerves. So what I've gone to doing in these rare cases is just going in the, basically in the web space dorsally and putting a snap in to try and release that intermetatarsal ligament and, and evacuate the hematoma that way. I like your pie crust idea. And then on the medial side, I just fi generally follow the uh, arch of the foot and go over the abductor halysis and release the superficial and deep fascia. You know, in the past, we used to try and dissect the three layers and the 14 compartments and, you know, everything looks the same. You've got bleeding, you have hematoma. And, uh, you know, in our place, we've had a few iatrogenic uh, nerve injuries, I think, uh, just from trying to deal with all the compartments. So the rare cases now, we just make that medial incision. The abductor halysis muscle there tends to really pooch out a little bit of the skin, like really prominent. And, and if you release the fascia door, uh, superficial and deep, and then just stop there, you can come back and skin graft it if you need to, if it doesn't, uh, uh, close down the road. But I like that pie crust idea. Uh, just, I, I would caution people making that classic two incision dorsal incision that can really run into problems, both with healing and down the road, if you need to get in there for uh, fixation, they can get colonized. Along yeah. those points, um, you know, if you're going to go on that medial side, it, I mean, this is off that kind of glabrous, uh, non-glabrous border. This is not through the heel pad or planter at all. You want to stay away from that. So really protect that planter skin and the heel pad. But for sure, you can do a lot of work from that medial side. That's a that's a very good point. Yeah, it's just a little planter to where the metatarsal is. So you're not you're not going certainly posterior. It's just really in the midfoot area. It would probably be planter to where that cuneiform is. And you can combine that with a little direct approach if you need to, to get that uh, area reduced. And you can still put a K-wire in there, uh, bury it or keep it uh, out through the skin if you need to. One question on the Q&A was whenever you use the hemostat, do you just do subcutaneous? I, I mean, I actually go a little bit deeper into that inner OCI compartment. And, uh, you know, I can't say I'm doing a full release of all those, but for sure, you're expressing that hematoma. 
and typically just by relieving that. And I mean, the hematoma can be a, a huge component just by offloading that you really can make the soft tissues a lot better. Perfect. Okay. Well, that's, uh, that's our hour. Uh, that went by very quickly. I just want to wrap up by, uh, just summarizing that of all the common themes of all of these emergencies that you may see uh, for regarding foot trauma, it's the soft tissue compromise that drives the emergency and the urgent intervention. So we talked about these conditions. We talked about how tongue type fractures, dislocated tailor bodies and foot compartment syndromes can all render some sort of problem with the soft tissues and that you need to intervene urgently in order to relieve the pressure in whatever uh, fracture specific manner is, is required. Um, that's it. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we really had a fun time this evening and, uh, hope that, um, you are able to, uh, synthesize some of this, uh, information into your own practice. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks Dave. Thanks, John. Appreciate thank you. It.